Nothing stays at the top forever, and that was certainly the case for IO Interactive post the release of Hitman Blood Money. IO had released four Hitman games in the span of six years, struggling together, crunching together, dedicating their lives together to make some of the best stealth games the industry has ever seen. Somehow making a bald guy in a suit with little to no emotions an industry icon. But as time moved on, so did IO and its staff, with an exodus of old guard like the director of Blood Money, Rasmus, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce his last name, leaving to become director of design at MYC4, four of the seven original founders of IO leaving the company to reform Red Omoto, the company that created IO Interactive as a joint venture with Nordisk Film back in 1998, and in April of 2009, Square Enix would buy Eidos for 84.3 million pounds, having all of Eidos's pre previously acquired studios like IO Interactive to follow under the Square Enix banner. Members of IO did remark though that they lost no freedom with this acquisition. Unfortunately, in November of 2010, IO did face layoffs as they restructured. It was never disclosed the actual number of said layoffs, but it was a sad event nonetheless. IO would also explore other ventures, releasing new IPs like 2K and Lynch games and Mini Ninjas. As more time passed, it seemed like they lost sight of what made their series so special. Just listen to the contrast between this dev diary with the director of Hitman Blood Money and this interview with the director of Absolution. We made some screenshots at a very early stage where, where Hitman was having a gun behind his back and that weren't really a feature in the game at that point. And then people really, um, really, you know, were talking about it on the fan sites and all that. So we sort of just had to put that in and we had no idea how to do that. But we, we felt that um, the, the trial and error gameplay of the old games was, it's kind of, it's not that fun to play it anymore. Uh, while you always have to like, you, you, you try a level and uh, within seconds you will get killed and you have to re replay and replay. So that's why we've been, we've been uh, making the game in a way that you can more, it, the game is more forgiving. So as you play through the levels, you can kind of learn and use the instinct feature to kind of uh, predict what will happen rather than having to experience it and and kind of die and, and restart. In the dev diaries for Blood Money, they prided listening and interacting with their hardcore fans to make the best game possible, closely listening to feedback and implementing some of their ideas. But now, in interviews with Absolution, it sounds like what people loved is old and outdated. After playing this game when it came out back in 2012, I always had this thought that the game was designed the way it was because it was trying to appeal to a more casual audience, as Hitman and stealth games as a whole are an acquired taste. You either like them or you don't, and their trial and error nature to master levels can turn off potential players. Of course, for years, all I can do was speculate that this was the reason, based off industry trends with how other studios were following the dumbed down to appeal to the Call of Duty audience formula. But after watching Noclip's documentary interviewing IO's current CEO, slash co-owner, and studio creative director, my suspicions were more than confirmed. And I recall back then sort of the mission briefing, if you will, of what we were trying to achieve was to make Hitman very playable. Uh, because up until till that point, stuff like you know basic controls of the character, getting the camera, getting combat, stealth action, all that stuff to really just feel uh, like you could pick up and play the game like you would pick up and play any other console game. There's nothing wrong with the idea of making a game more pick up and playable on paper. I just personally disagree with a lot of the ways they went about doing it. The other really telling thing is what influenced them, and in my opinion, was a misread on the meta, so to speak, of the game industry and their place within it at the time. And back when Absolution's original concepts were kind of formed, it was the heydays of Max Payne and Gears of War kind of thing. And that's where the trend was going and that's what the, you know, the creators wanted to back then. Absolution is the first Hitman game to be made on their new Glacier 2 engine, which allows for far more active NPCs in any given level. This was something that they really pushed and showed off at events with the Chinatown level as the market is sprawling with people. But in reality, this increase of NPC numbers and other features didn't get utilized nearly as much as we would have hoped, given what they pitched would be doable on this cutting edge engine. The biggest departure with Absolution is its level design. The levels are very linear compared to the sandboxes of old, but as I've said in previous videos, linearity isn't the core issue for most games. 
even if that's what people say it is. Linearity is the symptom, not the disease. The linear level design of this game with going from point A to point B is definitely a problem, but I think it's everything around it that makes it an issue. The root problem is the watering down of mechanics and the poorly implemented new additions. So first, let's go over what mechanics were removed from this game and how they affect the overall gameplay loop as a whole. The removal that gets me the most heated anytime I play this game is how the circular inventory has been replaced with a horizontal bar of seven squares. Instead of being able to hoard tons of items that could be used for different things, everything now has to fall into these five types so they can go into these specific slots. You have slot one for your silver ballers, slot two for your fiber wire, slot three for a melee item that can be thrown for a distraction or hit people with it, slot four is for a machine gun or shotgun, slot five is for other pistols, slot six is for explosives, and slot seven is for rifles. Because everything has to fit into these very restrictive formulas, nothing can be too different from the other options. If they are, then when you pick them up, they aren't a part of your seven slots, like medicine for example, which I think ruins the puzzle aspect of this game, since it removes the thinking aspect when going into killing targets. In the old games, you can walk past some random items and pick them up, like an aphrodisiac or chloroform and blood money, and then you'd have no idea what to do with them, requiring you to run around the level and see what they could be interacted with. Now, if you say pick up some sleeping pills, then it obviously goes into the pizza that's downstairs that only the target can touch, but the game gives you a prompt when you walk by it. This also changes how large weapons work, since they no longer need to be concealed within a level and can just disappear into 47's coat. So where you used to have to have a suitcase or carry the rifle in your left hand, you no longer have any issues with that and can just be a walking weapon cache. Syringes have been removed so you can no longer sedate or poison people directly or the items they interact with. They have been replaced with very scripted items that you find in the world, which have become very obvious block into square hole puzzles. The RUAP mines have been removed and replaced with remote C4 and proximity mines. The most you're ever really going to get out of them is finding them in the world and arming them so an unsuspecting target can walk past them and trigger them by accident. First person mode has been removed, and while it isn't the end of the world, it's a shame to see go, even if I found myself rarely using it in blood money since the weapons felt far less accurate in comparison to Contracts or Silent Assassin. The coin and the ability to throw weapons that aren't your melee items have been removed. The coin was incredibly broken in blood money, but with its removal and the ability to throw weapons makes the bottle the only option. In previous games, sometimes you can create openings by leaving weapons lying around so guards would come and pick them up and take them to their security room, like in the White House mission in Blood Money for example. Lock picking is only in the game at the end of checkpoint exits. There is only one single door in the entire game to my knowledge that you can lock pick that isn't an exit, and it's right next to the exit so who cares. This greatly restricts the level design since it results in very little reason to explore around, and the ability to branch off of levels in any meaningful way. They still have key cards in this game, but key card doors and lock pickable doors serve different functions in the previous titles. Key card doors required you to sneak into restricted areas so you can make progress in other more heavily restricted areas. Whereas the lock doors that can be picked were roadblocks that were, while easy to overcome, still posed as a risk versus reward for the player, and worked seemingly as the invisible hand of the level designer to show you this is a restricted area. So you don't just open a door and walk in only to instantly get in trouble because it was a restricted area but you had no way of knowing, which is a massive issue in this game. In the previous games, there were tiers to the type of restricted areas that corresponded to the type of door locks. Low-risk areas could be lockpicked, but they didn't instantly get you to anything meaningful. They usually required you to time yourself correctly, as well as being able to sneak past guards to get to said door, either by getting a disguise or by being in their blind spot, as well as being able to sneak past whatever comes next, since whatever's behind these locked doors wasn't your goal, but the path to it. Key-carded areas were usually heavily restricted areas that contained mission important things, like a target or something you needed to collect. Like for example, in Blood Money, this key card door in the rehab leads to where Agent Smith is being held captive. 
or this door in the opera house, which is a very important vantage point for the player to either snipe the opera singer or to see the targets aligned with the chandelier to explode it and drop it on top of him when he trips. Looking through keyholes has been removed, which is incredibly annoying because, like I mentioned earlier, there is no way to tell what a restricted area is, and if you open a door to one without even stepping inside of it in some instances, you will be spotted, which deducts points and loses you Silent Assassin. The obvious replacement is to use the new Instinct wall hack that lets you just see where everybody is, but that doesn't give you all the information you need. That's like just looking at the map in the previous game, and that's it. Instinct doesn't give you an idea of the layout of the room, which I find just as, if not more important than knowing where the people are in the room. It doesn't give you finer details, like is their vision being obstructed by something within the room, like a shelf for example. The full level sized map has been removed, which in most cases due to the level design of this game, it really isn't a problem. But in the few levels that are more like the old games, like the Chinatown missions, it is sorely missed. Other removed things come from the change in level design, since even if you could still do them, there would be no use for them as the game is now. Like the elevator kills from blood money, or concealing weapons and things like crates or other items, since there are no guards that frisk you in this game. It's either a restricted area you need a certain type of clothes to be able to walk freely in, or there is nothing. These are the major mechanics removed from the game, so let's get into what the game added, and with how much I feel like this will inevitably be ripping into the game, I want to start out on the positives and the quality of life changes. Movement for the most part has been made more fluid, with it becoming more in line with modern third-person cover shooters. This aspect really shows their idea of making the game as approachable as possible, so anybody can pick up and play it with no problem. The only issues come in with the wonky cover detection, invisible boundaries, constantly getting caught on shit in the environment, weird lag and sluggish movement when coming out of cover crouched, or walking crouched through doorways. When you fiber wire someone, you can now instantly drag their body after killing them. This adds to the fluidity of movement and is a welcomed addition. Along with the fluidity added from fiber wire kills, they also made it much faster to dump bodies in dumpsters and crates. In Blood Money, you had to open the lid, then get the body near it, then dump them in and close the lid, but now you just drag them near it and the animation does all the work for you. You can also now store two bodies in crates, along with the ability to now hide bodies in closets, and if there is only one body in a crate or a closet, you could hide along with them. You can now toggle dual wielding and these silencers for your silver ballers, instead of being stuck with your choice for an entire mission like in Blood Money. I really like that you could just take off the silencer whenever you want so you can cause a distraction or confuse the AI, even if it rarely comes up as something worth doing. Since you no longer have sedatives, you can now subdue enemies by putting them into chokeholds, which either puts them to sleep or kills them by snapping their neck. While this is nice, sometimes, no matter how hard I mash, knocking them out takes fucking forever. It never feels consistent, which drives me insane. Okay, it's time to talk about the bad. Like the clip I showed earlier, the dev team was really inspired by modern game trends, and boy, does it show in a lot of the poorly executed inclusions. Now, I'll preface this by saying that I'm the type of person who would rather other games just copy or innovate on a solution that one game did for genre conventions or limitations, rather than just ignoring the proven solution. Like how I bitch about every JRPG that has random battles but doesn't have the bravely default encounter rate slider. But a lot of the design ideas lifted from other games either doesn't fit the Hitman formula or are just straight up bad and force the game design down a certain path which I think makes this game a worse product. Let's start with point shooting, the mark and execute thing from Splinter Cell Conviction and Red Dead Redemption. On paper, it's a fine idea that I would personally never use since it seems more combat oriented, which I try to avoid when playing these games. The most important thing about it is to make sure you turn off the cinematic point shooting camera angles in these settings, because time doesn't stop during the execution of point shooting. So with it on, I ran into a ton of instances where the camera just froze at an angle, but all the guards reacted to me killing their comrade, which A, caused a higher alert, and B, they started shooting at me and I was taking damage since I have no control over 47 until point shooting is finished, and if you're playing on a higher difficulty, you run the risk of dying during this. I have no idea why they do not mention that this is a setting that can be turned off, and why it even comes on to begin with, but what I hate about it is how inconsistent
distant it can be. You can shoot at a car regularly all you want, and it'll take up to three clips of the ICA assault rifle and a full clip of two silver ballers for it to explode. But if you shoot a car once with point shooting, it blows up, no problem. It doesn't seem to matter either where you shoot it as long as you hit the body of the car and not just shoot the roof or one of the windows. The explosion radius also is a little wonky and leaves a lot to be desired. Instinct is your 7th gen detective vision that makes important things and people in the world glow piss yellow. I talked about it a little earlier, but since you have no full-sized real-time map or the ability to look through keyholes anymore, this is supposed to be your replacement for them, and the thing that you're supposed to be using to solve all of your problems. But this gives you incomplete information as it only shows you where they are in the room, but nothing really about it. Sure, they're in the room, and they're looking towards the door, but is there something inside that could be obstructing their vision. In a lot of the interviews and dev commentaries released before the game, they mentioned that a mechanic like this needed to be implemented because as they made the AI more complex, the game became too hard without it. I see this as being a band-aid for game design issues. Sure, you can make the AI the most complex and realistic thing possible, that any and all movement will be noticed and alert them, but does that make the game fun? does this in turn not just force players to avoid certain types of approaches because the AI does not allow it. Sure, the AI was dumb as fuck at times in the previous games, but being able to abuse the AI with things like the coin was really fun. The biggest reason I call Instinct a band-aid is because it covers for a lot of lackluster level design. Due to the removed features I mentioned earlier, and with how the AI reacts, and with how the levels are structured, there are so many instances where it would be impossible to do anything without it, or end up just being caught. So many hallways with awkward viewpoints. So many open area buildings that have sprinkled chest high cover around the edges to allow you to dart around without causing suspicion. As much as I hate instinct because it always feels like why not just permanently leave it on to have wall hacks 24 seven, without it I think the game would be far more annoying. With Instinct came the change to disguises, which everyone I've ever talked to about it has unanimously hated it. Now, when you don a disguise, you can no longer move freely around with it. Anyone who has the same uniform as you will start to become suspicious of you as their cone fills and they start to suspect you and ask who you are. And if they examine you long enough, then your disguise will be compromised. The way to counter this is to drain your instinct meter by tipping your fedora or scratching the back of your head like you just saw someone you went to high school with at the local doctor store and you're wearing your smurf pajama pants and you just remembered some really cringy shit you said in front of them and you hope to god that they didn't see you. I hate this change so much. It basically makes it so the player never wants to interact with an entire game mechanic. You know, the game mechanic that is iconic and synonymous with the series. You're more often than not just better off darting around vision cones than interact with the disguise system and the instinct meter. Also, when spending your meter to slip past guards, the delay for your HUD to fade back in can be so slow that sometimes you will miss the fact that someone is becoming suspicious of you and their suspicion cone is about to completely fill. This happens all the time on higher difficulties where they spot you incredibly fast. Since the suspicion meter seems to be based on vision, there is little to no reason to actually walk upright and not just go everywhere crouched, since it makes it harder for them to spot you, and you can now sprint while being crouched. There's honestly almost never a reason to be walking upright. I have such a little amount of footage of me not just walking crouched because it is always just so useful. There were so many instances where I was just about to be spotted, but because I was walking around crouched, and because their sightline of me broke for a millisecond, I was not spotted. Sure. NPCs will comment on you being weird or tell you to stop sneaking around, but that doesn't actually do anything. All that matters is the little yellow pyramid around the center of your screen. Another mechanic that goes hand in hand with instinct, the modernized movement, and disguises is the blending in mechanic. Similar to the one you would find in Assassin's Creed, you can now find things to blend in with, which for some reason makes you completely free of suspicion. What's that? The cop who is on the lookout for 47, who is on the run from the police, is getting suspicious of me while I'm in a cop uniform? Well, if I lean on this crane game, then I'm completely fine. This doesn't look more suspicious that one of your co-workers isn't looking for the guy who is running away from a crime scene of a burning hotel and ran away from an attack helicopter shooting at him. Nah, it's perfectly fine. Plus, you get a little bit of instinct back for doing this too. Hand-to-hand -hand combat has been reworked again. This time, it's turned into QTE events. On PC, it is an absolute nightmare, especially when you're playing on the higher difficulties. On consoles, you get these bright, big, colorful buttons 
buttons, but on PC you have these tiny prompts that appear randomly all over, so your eyes are darting around the screen trying to find them all, and at first glance they all look exactly the same. So good luck on Professional or Expert, where you will die in 3 hits. Also, bonking people over the head with melee weapons now instantly kills them, no matter the item, which is kinda weird. The worst inclusion is by far the rating system. This thing is turbo fucked. There is no nice way of putting it. It's fucking awful and I wish it wasn't in the game. There is so much wrong with it that it's hard for me to think about what to talk about first. Okay, so people discovering dead bodies doesn't actually matter, as long as they don't see the bullet connect with the target's head, or see you choking them out, or however you end up killing them, then it doesn't dock points and the AI won't get hostile. But if they do see the bullet connect with the target's head, even if they have no idea where you are and they have no vision of you and you snipe them from across the level, they will instantly know where you are even if it doesn't make any sense. But this qualifies as being a silent assassin. The biggest flaw with the rating system, if it wasn't already obvious enough after my previous example, is nonsensical logic and inconsistencies. Inconsistency in your game about precision is a death sentence to its quality in my opinion. The biggest inconsistency is the ratings themselves. In checkpoints where you can kill a target, the highest rating you can get is Silent Assassin, but there are plenty of checkpoints throughout the game that don't have targets, so your max rating is Shadow. But there is also checkpoints where there is no targets and no evidence to get, so the highest rating is only Specialist. Why make it like this? Hitman 2 Silent Assassin had plenty of levels where you just had to go from one point to the other, and the highest rating in that game was still Silent Assassin, even in those levels. The game also doesn't explain the differences at all and the biggest head-scratcher of them all is the fact that there are sections in this game where there are no rating system, which begs the question to be asked, why include the rating system at all then? What makes this section need it and this section not? In some levels with targets you need to eliminate, you'll have an objective to locate them first. If you don't bother to locate them and instead run to set up an accident for them to die to, or get in a position to kill them later, then when you do kill them, then the rating system will say both target kill and non-target kill making it impossible for you to get Silent Assassin. If you don't swing your camera over him for a nanosecond while he's in the club, and just run to the room to shoot him through the mirror, then you will not have located him. Apparently, this isn't locating the target. You have to see them in the wild, because apparently looking through a one-way mirror where I can actually identify him doesn't count. Let's not forget about the issue of being spotted because you couldn't tell an area was restricted and you opened a door and this counts as trespassing. While they may not aggro, this still docks a shit ton of points, not to mention the weird restricted area boundaries where leaning against certain objects in the perimeter of the restricted area counts as being in it. There is probably even more issues and dumb things about the rating system that I don't even know that others have pointed out. I just really hate how the rating system further pushes players to ignore certain game mechanics like pacifying or disguises. You can knock somebody out and hide the body where no NPC will ever look, but if it's not in a crate or a closet, then you're not going to get the points back that you lost for pacifying them. Okay, to talk about the last bad addition, that requires to get into discussion about level design. So let's talk about the two meh additions of the game that don't really add anything positive or negative, and then we'll loop back around and start talking about level design. Challenges are rather self-explanatory. Each checkpoint has a set of challenges you can do within them to unlock stuff. The only reason it's in the meh category and not in a good addition is because I find that they are pretty non-existent in this game. Each level has the same cookie cutter options and then a handful of others that are checkpoint specific, but a lot of the time it's just a name and a pun and not an actual description. I'd be willing to bet that most people that are interested in doing said challenges will just look up how to do them online, or at least a description of them, so they can get an idea of what the game wants them to do instead of just a stupid pun that leaves you no idea what it actually wants. Assassin techniques are basically perks or buffs or stat increases, uh, you could categorize them a few ways, but you unlock these things for completing challenges and missions. I'm going to be completely honest that I never noticed these until this playthrough for this video. They are so irrelevant that I've never noticed their changes in actual gameplay. 
which I guess is a good thing because I think having stats widely modify and vary gameplay would be far worse than a system that could go completely unnoticed for 8 years. Seriously, these assassination techniques are shit like 7% faster running speed or improved rates of firing while dual wielding pistols. To be completely frank, I am convinced that these things do not work properly or are so irrelevant that you could completely miss them mashing through the post level screens. There is no way that this perk makes subduing targets faster, that shit is at level 3 and it still takes fucking forever to knock people out on experts sometimes. Like I said at the start of this video, the level design has taken a much more linear approach compared to the sandboxes of old. Instead of having a mission given in a single location, this time around the story is structured in segmented based levels, with most of it going from point A to point B. This game has 20 levels, two of which I hesitate to even include because they last 30 seconds, with a total of 53 checkpoints. Points. 35 of these checkpoints, which function as their own levels, are 47 going from point A to B. Single entrance, single exit corridors. Only 16 of these checkpoints contain targets to kill. Originally, the game didn't have any at all, but after the negative reception of their first E3 showcase, they had to course correct, which is why a bunch of the targets feel completely arbitrary, having zero buildup or intimacy for why you're killing them. In the previous games, you would have a briefing about these wannabe bombs villains, but now you just kill someone because they're in your way, or because the notebook gives 47's loose reasoning on why he targets them. Where and how did you find out about this guy's irrational hatred for pigs due to childhood trauma 47? The worst one in my opinion are these three scientists in Dexter's Dead Factory. You just get inside and the game tells you that these are your targets. I could easily see this level having three completely different targets, or even just being another A to B mission and nothing of value would have been lost. That final bad new feature I said we'd get into once I started to talk about the level design is checkpoints. So instead of being able to save anywhere at any time in a level like you could do in the past three games, you now have glowing bat signal checkpoints that you can activate along with automated checkpoints that trigger, which are seemingly placed at random. When I think of saving at a checkpoint, I think that means everything goes back to as it was when I saved and just kicks me back to that game state. Well, that's not how it works in Hitman Absolution. The game has a set layout when you reload a checkpoint. This has become a feature used in speedrunning the game as when you reload a checkpoint in certain segments, it reshuffles the NPCs to be in a more advantageous position. But for most people, you know, this is not how they want checkpoints to work. Why would I want to reset things I had already interacted with? Why would I want to change locations of targets and other NPCs in the world? The game also doesn't save your actual progress for these checkpoints. If you are playing a level and made it through a few of the segmented checkpoints, not the bat signal checkpoints, the actual selectable checkpoints in the menu. I know this is confusing, but stay with me for a second. So you've played enough for your current session and want to take a break. If you exit the game and come back later, it will reload you to that point, but it will not have saved your current inventory and disguise, and instead will give you a pre-made loadout for the level. I found this out during the level Hunter and Hunted. In the second checkpoint, you go through a strip club and you can get a silenced pistol in the security room on the second floor. Now this pistol is really useful since it is the only silenced weapon that I know of that you can get before you get your silver ballers back later in the game. So I made it to the final segment when you need to kill three guys in Chinatown again, but since I don't really like the game, I could only play it in short bursts. So I decided I had played enough for a while and wanted to take a break and close the game. It gives you a prompt saying all unsaved data will be lost. Okay, I just got to this segment and saw the autosave icon on the corner, and if you reload this checkpoint, I get kicked back right to where I was standing. But when I come back later, I had the basic loadout of this segment that the devs, I guess, assumed you would have, so I no longer had the silenced pistol which I needed if I wanted to do one of the accident kills without putting everyone in Chinatown into an alert or panic state. The thing that really makes no sense about this is if you go to the main menu and hit continue, you still have your equipment. This only happens when you fully close the game, and I have no idea why it is like this. A lot of these levels contain nonsensical invisible walls and terrible collision boxes which snag 47 all the time. If you open a door and try to go through it too fast, enjoy the invisible wall. Trying to sneak through a minefield? Enjoy this invisible wall. Reload a level to a previous checkpoint? Enjoy sometimes not being able to 
move at all and having an invisible box around you so you can't move forward, and you end up missing your window to sneak past things since the area is on a timer. Seriously, fuck this stupid motel level on Expert. Even in levels that feel more like the games of old, that try to have creative puzzles, the solution is often right next to them. Like in Shaving Lenny, this wire can be loosened with a wrench, so when the guy comes over and pisses on it, you can zap him. Oh wow, it's mighty convenient that not only did the game tell me what to do with a tutorial prompt, but the wrench is laying right next to it. Do you guys see what I'm getting at when I say that everything around the linearity is the real issue? There are plenty of games that are huge successes and dearly beloved that were linear. Just look at RE4. Plenty of areas in that game are just a line. This game's problem is being incredibly dumbed down to the point of no substance. I look back at the level list and I wonder, what did I even do in half of these? The answer is nothing. So much of these levels push you to be as uninteractive with the game as possible, further helped by the mechanics and the systems of this game that I complained about earlier. This is also the course corrected version, mind you. The game was originally even more quote unquote linear cinematic experience, which makes me wonder what the fuck were you even going to be doing in that game? And the biggest clusterfuck of it all is there is no simple solution. Each aspect builds and informs how the other functions. It is an interwoven blanket of shit. This is why this video has been so difficult to write, because it's constantly requiring me to tangent about how one thing negatively influences several other features, even if I haven't actually explained the other features yet. It's why I fear this video will inevitably, no matter how much I try to prevent it, feel all over the place jumping from one thing to the next. If you just fixed slash changed one thing, like making the levels all sandboxes for example, then they would just feel empty with little to interact with due to the lack of tools and watering down of mechanics, making their sandbox nature unjustifiable. And if you only just added in the removed features from Blood Money, you'd have nothing to use your tools on, leaving them to inevitably be forgotten or result in players frustratingly trying to use them despite the game's constant fighting you not to. The game is fundamentally flawed and there is no way of fixing it short of just making a new game using some of the ideas and learning from the failed implementations of this game. The basic plot of this game is that Diana has betrayed the agency and gone rogue, leaking tons of important information about the agency, so it's up to 47 to kill her. As he fatally shoots her, she tells him to take care of a girl she helped escape, as it was the whole reason why she went rogue, because all the experiments they did on 47 is being done to this girl, and Diana doesn't want another kid to end up like 47. So now it is up to Agent 47 to save her and travel across the country as a mass serial killer with a bandaid on the back of his head. Let's take a moment to focus focus on 47 as a character in this game. I think this image perfectly encapsulates everything wrong with this game's story and especially its interpretation of 47's character. 47 is a horribly inconsistent emotional wreck throughout this game that gets guilted into taking care of a kid he just met. He's vindictive, he's angry, he's vulnerable, and he's filled with self-doubt. While 47 has always shown signs of not being a complete robot, like in Hitman 2 for example, this feels like a completely different direction from everything established. It feels like a different character given 47 skin. These emotional shifts are too sudden and a lot of it is off-screen changes, further adding to this feeling of disconnect. Originally in this scene with 47 in the apartment across the street from the church was much longer and you could really see the Max Payne influences here with 47 getting drunk and unstable. He even attempts to kill himself. Now this scene in the final product has 47 sitting in the chair and a picture of Diana is at 50% opacity over him. Then there is a distortion of all the removed parts from this cutscene ending with 47 cutting his barcode. Okay, I'm going to try to be as fair as possible to this game, giving it the benefit of the doubt when I can, but why did they make it so he doesn't just fully cut off his tattoo? It looks really stupid when you can clearly see it sticking out over the band-aid in close-ups. He just slashed through it with a straight razor like he's a member of the Akatsuki. It makes even less sense that he did this at all in the ending of the game when it reveals that Diana's death was a fake-out, and all of the events of the game were planned from the start, with 47 in on it thanks to a letter from the beginning. The plan was to flush out Travis and the other members of the ICA that were doing their own experiments and basically going rogue themselves for their own self-gain. Which makes the apartment scene make even less sense as well because 47 knows she's still alive, so why is he acting distraught? Why was all of 47's dialogue and internal monologues in the notebook all acting like he's carrying out her dying wish? 
Oh, I know why. All of these events and acting is a front to fool the players so they can have a twist at the end of the game, which then makes everything said and done to orchestrate this twist nonsensical and dumb in retrospect. It's like when in Heavy Rain, spoiler for the 10 year old game that is Heavy Rain, skip to this time code if you don't want to be spoiled, where Scott Shelby's thoughts actively lie to the players so they didn't know he was the killer. 47's level of competency also widely varies throughout the game so the plot can move forward and get 47 from one situation to the other. He has to fail to fiberwire Sanchez to get knocked out so the entire hotel sequence can happen, only to easily beat him in the ring later in the game if you choose to fight him using the wrestler disguise. <laughs> He has to be tased and knocked out so he can be captured and tied up by the sheriff and Dexter, only to easily escape minutes later. Going back to the hotel scene, after all of these years, I still don't really get what Dexter's goal was here. It makes sense that he doesn't want to kill 47 because he doesn't want the attention of the ICA for killing their top agent, and he has no idea that 47 has quote unquote gone rogue, but I don't really get what he planned to do with killing the maid and then putting the knife in 47's hand, despite holding it himself himself so his fingerprints are all over it anyways. And it's also his hotel room. Did he think he was framing 47 for murder and this would somehow slow him down and not something that he could easily walk away from? Or that this would scare 47 the legendary bald killer clone? I guess it did spook him based on his reaction when he woke up. And then in the heat of the moment he goes, Nah. One second thought and pours liquor onto the floor and lights it on fire. Does this mean he completely changed his mind and is now 100% on board with going up against the world's Illuminati? We have to assume that he's the one that called the police and showed up knowing that there was a body in the room. So 47 has to escape out the window and scale the ledge to the fire escape in the front of the building. And while he's doing that, an officer on a megaphone is calling up to him to remain calm and stay where he is, completely ignoring the fact that the building is on fire and now exploding. Their first assumption is the fact that he's moving to get away and not the fact that the building is collapsing. They don't acknowledge the huge neon sign exploding off its stand and falling into the street. They're just pissed that 47 is getting away. And after all of this effort, the police are a non-issue for the rest of the game, and these events are posed as, at most, a minor inconvenience for 47, and didn't stop his hunt for Dexter at all. Dexter didn't even bother to make sure the job was done, and is surprised when the legendary hitman is still after him. Did he really think the person that he called a ghost and a myth would stop by putting a knife in his hand while he was unconscious and calling the police? At that point, why not just do the same events but then shoot 47 in the head and make it look like a murder-suicide? The obvious reason this doesn't happen is because there would be no game then, so they need to write this stupid event so the plot can move forward. The other big issue I take with the story of this game is its depiction of the ICA, or at least the part of it we get to see, as the higher powers within the ICA are just referred to by name but never shown. I always thought of the ICA as the Illuminati of this series' world, which is why I called them that a few sentences earlier. The only thing you had to attach to them was the name and the mission briefings you got before hits. The only tangible piece of them was Diana's voice. And then my favorite one from Blood Money was the messages left in locations that 47 had to go get himself in envelopes, like in a random high up shelf in a library book somewhere. Or the one that was hand delivered to him and because the courier saw his face, he had to kill him. They felt ever present, powerful yet invisible. Similarly to the Patriots in Metal Gear Solid, while it is revealed by Jade that Travis has been lying to upper management about what he's been doing, it still doesn't negate the bad taste of my mouth that is given from seeing how the ICA is portrayed for the entirety of the game, as this reveal only comes in the final 10 minutes. I'm 90% sure that upper management did know the entire time what Travis was doing because of Diana's plan from the beginning to flush him out, but then that just makes all this feel like a really roundabout way of getting rid of him. Despite the revelation at the end of the game, the ICA still, 
with or without Travis's acting in self-interest, operates out of a stock market war room on a yacht in Morocco, which I just find really lame and ruins the magic and mysticism of the ICA. The wiki says he is the head of division for the ICA. I'm not really sure what that actually entails or how accurate this post is, but as we are shown in the game, he is running the ICA to a decent extent, while there are shadowy figures above him that are funding the agency. The mysticism of the ICA is really de-elevated when you see them doing things like the mass shooting of everyone at this motel, again to give them the benefit of the doubt and try to see what they were potentially going for with these scenes. Maybe they're trying to really reinforce the idea of how powerful the ICA is. The fact that they could kill all of these innocent random people that just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and cover it up with absolute ease. Along with taking over an entire town and having this stupid fucking group of assassins with machine guns and rocket launchers. The most unsubtle group of Illuminati contract killers imaginable. I hate the Saints so much. Everybody got so worked up over them leading up to the release of the game. And this is what we got? They're literally nothing. You could remove them from the game and it would make no fucking difference. They do not impact the plot in the slightest. I'd probably like them if they had some weird Suda51 style group of personalities or something. Literally anything. But they are so nothing. All the controversies and outcries from publications and the apologies from IO. For this? Come in sing <laughs> Where'd you go? IO released an app on the iOS store called Hitman Absolution Full Disclosure. They put out the app in 2013, a year after the game's release, to show some behind the scenes, revealing a lot of early concepts, scrapped ideas, and cut content. It's where I got the Max Payne style cutscene of Drunk Suicidal 47 from. It has since been delisted from the app store, so all I can go off of are these uploads on YouTube and people talking about it on forums. And the Saints aren't really brought up other than this one unused dialogue of their leader. So that leads me to believe that they didn't really cut their inclusion down due to the controversies. They were intended to be these nothing of characters from the start, being introduced in one cutscene and then get killed in the next level with ease, with a total of maybe 10 minutes of screen time. The final story aspect I think holds this game back from what it sets out to achieve is the centerpiece herself, Victoria. I have stated in multiple videos that I hate kid characters. They are the fucking worst. They're usually incredibly annoying and get in the way of enjoyable aspects of the plot, and they are almost always there as a conflict-creating device to move the story forward and get the main characters to the next plot beat. After thinking about it some more, I don't even really hate Victoria. The issue I have with her is she is in so little of the game, yet the entire thing is framed around wanting to protect and save her. I can't hate her because she has nothing to hate. She has no character. She is an idea to push 47 into this ham-fisted arc that goes nowhere. She is just a MacGuffin for about 85-90% to 90 of the game, having conversations with 47 only in a handful of scenes. It probably would have been way worse to constantly have Victoria tagging along with you or have to constantly check in with with her, but the game as is gives no reason to care for this kid other than being told you should care about her, because she was in the same position 47 was as a kid, which 47 had no say in, and it was Diana's request to protect her. Hitman Absolution released on November 20th, 2012, to mostly positive reviews, scoring a 79 on Xbox and PC and an 83 on the PlayStation 3. While scoring high marks from the usual suspects like IGN, Destructoid, and Game Informer, there was definitely a noticeable divide on the game, and it quickly became the most divisive in the series, both with fans and reviewers alike. In March of 2013, it was reported that while Absolution did sell 3.6 million units since its release, not counting digital sales, it did not meet the sales expectations and played a role in Square Enix's report of $105 million in losses for the fiscal year. And in June, as a result, IO was hit with another round of layoffs, this time almost half of its staff at the company and had other projects cancelled. In the Noclip documentary, they said that since the game took seven years to make because the tech just wasn't there at the time, the industry moved away from linear experiences back to more open games, and I will respectfully disagree 
disagree since there were plenty of successful linear games before it and the following year The Last of Us came out to critical acclaim and was a mega hit. Absolution in fact does a lot of the things people lauded Sony first party titles for doing before them. But the gameplay became the vehicle for the story, unlike the previous titles where the story was a vehicle for the gameplay. And when your gameplay isn't that fun, and in fact is quite bad in my opinion, when it's made in service of this lackluster plot, it's inevitably going to be criticized. I really think they lost sight of what people wanted and expected from this series. The industry was still in a perfectly fine place for a game like this to be a huge success. The formula is fine, it's the game that isn't. With or without the Hitman IP, I think if this game came out as is, it still would have been pretty divisive because of all the issues with gameplay I've listed earlier. While the game was panned by fans and didn't make the mark sales-wise, IO did notice something. A dedicated fan base still coming back to play Contracts mode, the new quote-unquote multiplayer feature for this game. Players could load into a level and create their own custom targets by killing people and setting rules for how to kill them. Now you may be wondering why I left something that is arguably the second half of the Absolution package, and to some the only redeeming quality of the package, to the conclusion section of this video. That's because the servers sadly went offline in 2018, as IO doesn't own the servers they were hosted on, so I have no way to access this game mode for myself to get footage, so the only thing I could go off of is memories of when I played the game in 2012 and other people's Let's Plays. In 2013, Square said due to the financial losses, they planned to reevaluate their strategies with a focus on mobile games. This was during the great era of Japanese studios shitting the bed and then running to mobile gambling to print their money. In 2014, Square Enix Montreal would release Hitman Go, a game that recontextualizes the Hitman formula to work as a board game and even recreates some of the most iconic levels, along with releasing Hitman Sniper, which, with how little I have admittedly interacted with it, it seems to be more of the Sniper Challenge mode that came as a pre-order bonus for Absolution when getting it at GameStop or on Steam. Both of these games are available on iOS and Android stores. Originally, I had planned to do a retrospective on Hitman Go, as I like the game, and I'm glad that 47 didn't get the Sam Fisher treatment or got shipped off to Gotcha Hell. But then I realized there really isn't much to say about the game. It's a fun little puzzle game on your phone, that was probably the only game on phones that I ever really like, even if I have no reason to ever touch that version again now that it's out on PC. After all was said and done, it honestly looked really grim for the fate of Hitman and IO. It seemed like maybe 47's time was over and we'd never see him again. But in 2014, IO released an open letter to Hitman fans saying that they were making a new game for PC and next gen, going back to their roots, taking what they learned and the best aspects of Absolution, and with large inspiration from blood money and contracts, they were going to make the ultimate Hitman fantasy. I for one remained very skeptical that they could actually do this after the colossal disappointment that Absolution was for me. But after another two years, IO and 47 would return to form in a new direction with Hitman 2016. If you've made it this far into the video, I just want to say thanks for watching as always. If you really liked the video, please share it around because these Hitman videos sadly don't get a lot of views. And if you really like the channel, maybe consider becoming a patron on Patreon. All patrons get access to videos a day early, and I am now going to shout out my $5 and up patrons who really help support the channel. Bully, Comrade Fox, Tristan the White Wolf, Dusty the Zombie, Filthy Finger 69, Clivermort, Fies, William Moore, Mr. Kill Jr., Tyler Scherzer, Some Panda, Poke Joke S, Josh Joshua D. Larino, Chichomatrius, Ben Johnson, Sarah Chan, Oods of Nudes, Fish Kami, Joan Eisen, Alejandro Benitez, Star Fox, Flarboo, and Mitchell. Thanks so much, guys. I also want to thank Cotty for taking some time out of his day to check this video before I put it out to make sure I didn't have any mistakes. A link for his channel and Twitter will be in the description below. I recommend checking him out if you really like Hitman speedruns. If you're a card game player of any kind, I have a TCG player affiliate link in the description below. Any purchases you made using this link will give me a small kickback, so it's just another way to easily support the channel. As for what's coming next, tune in Wednesday to see Metal Arms glitch in the system, the Forgotten Classic, and next Sunday for the Hitman 2016 retrospective. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.